Thanks a lot for inviting me today. And it's been really, really interesting hearing um, people's contributions today and especially in the discussions as well. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about the shrinking space for um, the participatory shrinking space for young people in their digital environment and specifically looking at the psychological impact of growing up in a quantified world and how this might impact autonomy and agency and importantly also what we should be doing about it. Um, I'm project coordinator for the Youth and Technology Project at Tactical Tech, and we're an international, international NGO that's been working for almost 20 years now on the impact of technology on society and individuals. And we're finding creative ways to give people knowledge and understanding of what they can do through research, toolkits, public interventions and exhibitions, and also workshops and trainings. Um, and so what do we mean when we talk about shrinking spaces for youth participation in the digital environment? And I'm gonna jump straight into the topic and then um, at the end, talk a little bit more about Tactical Tech's approach and what we're doing as part of our youth project. Um, so social media felt like a good place to, to start this discussion. I'm sure we're all familiar with this image of the Facebook like button. Um, the Facebook Like was launched in 2009 and it, it quickly became a potent data collection tool revealing a lot about users. Um, I thought it was worth mentioning as well that um, Facebook started in 2003 and it was actually set up by adolescents and young adults themselves. It was originally called FaceMash and it was a college networking site where college students could compare photos to choose the more attractive person. And so you can kind of see this is the the humble and questionable beginnings of Facebook. Um, so by the time the like button was introduced in 2009, Facebook had 600 million users and was the most popular social networking site worldwide. So from this early innovation, we can see how one small design feature can be really momentous in collecting data. A 2013 study revealed that Facebook likes could infer really deeply personal and sometimes private attributes about a person, including sexual orientation, ethnicity, personality traits, uh, use of predictive substances, uh, as well as age and gender. And crucially, the like button and everything that it represents is particularly enticing and mesmerizing for young people, this idea of social inclusion and belonging. And I think this kind of carries through the development of social media and the way that it impacts young people's kind of feelings towards um, participation. So by the time Facebook bought Instagram in 2012, this behavioral data collection was already very established and advanced. And they also crucially bought this service onto mobile phones. So into the people's pockets, it's suddenly very accessible. And this changed the nature of how people interacted with these platforms. It's useful to, to think about interaction with these platforms, not just in terms of the visible actions we take, such as liking or commenting or sharing, but also in terms of all of the data that is inferred and assumed from these actions. So perhaps a comment used a lot of exclamation marks, which could indicate that we're excited or angry. So it's not just what we're saying, but also the way that we're saying it. And you may have heard the, the design of digital technologies likened to casinos and slot machines. Um, and like slot machines, these technologies are designed to be totally immersive so that one loses their sense of self-awareness and conscious decision-making. And it's actually carried along by the machine, so you're chasing gratification. And this is particularly relevant for young people using social media who, as I've said before, are, are drawn to this peer recognition, belonging, and acceptance. Um, and these immersive and, and mesmerizing spaces dominate their social environment and can create a feeling of performance. At best, maybe a teenager is on their phones for longer than their parents would like, but at worst, switching off from these technologies can create feelings associated with, with clinically diagnosed addictions, so cravings, anxiety, frustration, isolation. And at Tactical Tech, we, we try and highlight the, what's behind our screens in a more tangible way. This is a poster from um, one of our projects called The Glass Room, which is a pop-up exhibition that is currently touring on the topic of misinformation. And this poster asks the question, should we be blaming ourselves for not being able to put down our phones? And I just wanted to 
highlight a couple of the, the words on this poster. So one of them is it rewards you for everything. So this is the concept of the like, whether it's you know a thumbs up or down or a love heart, these features really create this dopamine boost. Also the typing bubble, someone's responding to you. Um, and on the right here, it makes it easy to keep going. So here we kind of highlight features such as the infinite scroll, something that just is never ending and it's constantly giving you information or the autoplay. I'm sure we can all relate to the, the idea of watching a video and then suddenly the next one comes up without you ever having to leave your sofa. Um, so these kind, of, um, these kind of posters and these kind of um, initiatives really try to highlight some of the features that we all become very used to. And I think it's very easy to overlook them, especially when you're used to using social media. And I think we should acknowledge the fact that young people on social media um, have, is not necessarily something that they've gotten used to, it's something that they've grown up with. And there's a, quite a big distinction there. Um, I wanted to show a quick one minute clip from former executive at Facebook um, talking at Stanford Graduate School. And I hope that the sound will work. So. Uh, if you could give me a thumbs up, if you can hear this clip. Consumer internet businesses are about exploiting psychology. And that is one where you want to fail fast because, you know, people are unpredictable. And so we want to psychologically figure out how to manipulate you as fast as possible and then give you back that dopamine thing. We did that at, brilliantly at Facebook. Instagram has done it. WhatsApp, you know, Snapchat has done it. Twitter has done it. So there are great examples. WeChat is doing it. There are great examples of Failing fast is the right path to exploiting psychology of mass populations of people. Where I have decided to spend my time is to take the capital that they rewarded me with and now focus on the structural changes that I can control. I can't control them. I can control my decisions, which is I don't use this shit. Um, I can control my kids' decisions, which is they're not allowed to use this shit. So I wanted to show this clip for, for a number of different reasons. Um, it's actually a much longer talk. It's about 50 minutes, but I think this is the, the two parts that are the most interesting to me. Um, one, I think one of the most interesting things is the detachment from responsibility. So this very disruptive mentality of we were doing great things, you know, maybe some people were harmed along the way, but, you know, we were innovating. And also that users are in some way complicit in why these platforms are so addictive. And I think this is a really key point. Um, in that who should be responsible for why these platforms are so manipulative or who should be responsible for why there's misinformation online. And I think there's always this, this tug of war between, you know, are the users responsible or are the platforms responsible? And then when, where do young people fit into that mix? Um, and also just, just that he also said he doesn't use these platforms and that he doesn't let his, his kids use these platforms and the audience laughs. And I just think this is the most... Um, kind of like shocking and absurd um, thing to hear somebody who, who helped to design this platform taking such a dramatic step away from it. Um, and I wanted to include, include this concept of onstage, offstage. So in Shoshana Zuboff's book, The Age of Surveillance Cap Capitalism, she dedicates one of the last chapters to the topic of the next generation. And this chapter is called Of Life in the Hive. And in there, there's a particularly striking concept that I found really useful when trying to understand what this means for young people's sense of identity in relation to the technologies they use. So this is the, in this concept, Zuboff bases it on the writings of a mid-century social psychologist, Irving Goffman. Um, and this is when an actor finishes the performance and goes off stage or backstage, which becomes a universal metaphor as a place where we can retreat, where we can be ourselves, where we are no longer being watched. It's a place where we can have the joy of secrets and where we can have silence and be annoyed. On the contrary, on stage is the performance side of it. So the curation of photographs in social media's case or the anticipation of the like or the dopamine rush of a new friend. And Suboff gave a lecture to university in 2017 and she noted down this quote from a student that I found quite, um, quite compelling in relationship to this topic. And the student said, the difference is that Goffman assumed a backstage where you could be your true self. For us, the backstage is shrinking. There is almost no place left where I can be my true self. Even when I'm walking by myself and I think I am backstage, something happens and I discover that I am on stage and everything changes. So here, I think the chilling effect can really be seen. This, this constant connection, performance, subsequent surveillance, 
brings all of the online pressures into the offline world. The concept of social media mirror is a vast and open network of many eyes seemingly always watching. So even the user is experiencing themselves from the outside looking in. And a 2016 study described this extended chilling effect of Facebook, where people now censor and curate their real world behavior in consideration of how it will appear to their online network and all of their potential future online networks. So this alongside the dopamine feedback loops and the addictive social conformity gradually breaks down this ability to make conscious, autonomous and critical decisions. So we have to think about this in the space of if youth are wanting to participate politically or not in civil society, how, how do these platforms actually change and morph that? And I won't necessarily talk about misinformation today, but I think that comes into it massively as well. This idea that if the information that you're seeing you can't trust or perhaps it's not, it's not kind of verified or true, then how will that also shape people's opinions of, of things and young people's kind of assumptions about the world as they're learning about it? And this line between the offline and the online life is becoming blurred and, and really harder to define. So knowledge, social relationships, navigation, spatial awareness is all becoming dependent on a device or network, which I'm sure everyone here today can, can relate to. Um, and I wanted to use here education and the, the booming ed tech market as an example. So the pandemic has really compounded this problem of digital dependency. Since March 2020, Google Classroom has doubled in active users and its video conference, conferencing tool used by many schools has increased by 900%. And 68% of countries are depending on remote learning. So is this new normal going to lead to a sustained growth and ubiquity of the biggest tech platforms in education environments, which also creates a dependency outside of the school environment? If young people are using um, the Google education suite that maybe they set up a Google account, they become normalized and used to these platforms. And with students not being able to go into school for exams, schools are turning to exam software such as Proctorio and, and ExamSoft. And this software has the ability to record faces and scan their rooms, so there's an added, added aspect of surveillance. And some critics say that they have not been built to consider race, class or disability, so bias kind of comes into it as well. And we're beginning to see pushback to some of these surveillance and monitoring technologies used in schools. This is a petition that two California law students filed requesting that it cancel the exam entirely and institute a new form of assessment. And some states in the US have already dropped exams entirely because of student pressure at not using this algorithmic proctoring software. And similarly in the UK in August earlier this year, tens of thousands of students across the United Kingdom protested against the use of an algorithm that had been used to give them their end of school grades as they couldn't take their exams. And this resulted in 40% of students, many from lower income or more disadvantaged backgrounds being marked down. And the algorithm was biased because it was based on largely historical data. Because of the pressure from the protesting students, the decision to use the algorithm grading system was backtracked and the students were given their original predicted grades. So how do young people move towards a culture of identity and self-authorship and personal autonomy? And how can we create spaces for critical thinking and discourse and alternative solutions for young people? Um, in this next section, I'm gonna outline a few of the ways that we're trying to address this at Tactical Tech. Um, so the first one is through data literacy. So it's not just an understanding of what data is, but also everything that surrounds it how it works, who owns it, what can it be used for, how to take control over it. And as we have seen, when, when young people are made aware of how these digital technologies work and how they can impact their rights and what they can action. And I think that's a really key point. It's that if this education becomes something that they are exposed to from a young age around data and technologies, the impact that it has on society and themselves as individuals and their autonomy, then they may be more likely to, to participate in making change and shaping their digital futures. And I also wanted to include this quote from Bibin Kidron, who runs the organization in the UK Five Rights. And she says, young people may be thumb fast, but that does not make them data savvy. And this is a really good thing to remember when, when making resources for young people. There is often the assumption 
that because they're really quick at learning and adapting to new technologies, that they'll understand the implications of them. And I think we should never make this assumption when talking and teaching about digital technologies and digital rights. So this is one of the resources that we released earlier this year at Tactical Tech. It's um, based on our Data Detox Kit project, which is a self-learning guide to, to data and how to reduce it. Um, so we, we created an interactive youth workbook that is designed to be used offline in printed format. And it covers four topics from online privacy to digital security, digital well-being, and the last section on misinformation. And these activities guide young people through the different components of their digital lives. Um, and since releasing this in April, we've had a really great response from librarians and teachers, parents and, and other youth initiatives around the world. And it's now available in six languages with nine more in the pipeline. Just last week, we, um, we released the translation into Shan, a Burmese language, which was translated by the Shan School of State and Nationalities. So it's really great to see um, how these kind of resources can be useful in contexts where perhaps digital or data literacy isn't part of the curriculum or isn't part of the kind of um, syllabus in education. And the second thing I wanted to touch on was critical thinking and awareness. So going back to this this addictive nature of technologies and the idea of slot machines. So as digital technologies become more ubiquitous, we need to make sure that our awareness is heightened so that we create a friction. You know, if digital technologies are slippery, where can we create the friction to stop them from influencing us and manipulating us in such a way? Um, and awareness is really the key to making informed and critical choices about our uses of technology. And especially for young people who have grown up in, in totally digital environments, we should encourage critical questions and looking behind the screens instead of at the screens. Um, so the case for a creative response, I think um, this is quite key to a lot of the work that Tactical Tech does. And these images were taken at our pop-up public intervention, The Glass Room, which um, I showed before, which uses art to kind of demyst demystify some of the ways in which technology impacts society. And it's from projects such as these that we've really noticed a demand among um, educators and parents and even young people for a creative and play playful response to these issues that allows people to reflect in a meaningful and sometimes more abstract way. Um, and it's also through creative responses that we have an opportunity to understand things in a different way, to break them down, to break down our assumptions, to create new vocabularies, to learn about something from a new perspective. And finally, um, collaboration and co-development. At the center of our work over the coming months will be a very youth-centered approach through co-creation workshops, collaborative working models, and making resources by and for young people that address these challenges that they face. Um, I wanted to, to close just on a, a series of questions which I thought might help to, to inform the discussions after this. Um, so these, these questions kind of are helping to, sh to shape how this youth project develops at Tactical Tech. What needs to be done to the current digital environment to make it appropriate, equitable and fair for young people? What do we need to do to build data and systemic literacy and citizenship into the educational curriculum? And finally, what would a positive digital future environment look like? And how can we ensure that this happens in a sustainable and proactive way with young people at the center of it? Um, so that, that concludes the presentation. Thanks, thanks a lot for listening. And um, I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, the next contributions and also for the discussion.